The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, MetLife Insurance Limited, ABN 75004274882, AFSL 238096, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before before making a decision. My name is Sasha Ludkovsky and I'm a former insurance advisor and founder of The Sale Agency, where I specialise in helping financial professionals transform complex concepts into engaging content. Join me and our guests as we address the rising costs and affordability of insurance and explore strategies and solutions to help your clients meet their protection needs and help you facilitate cost-effective insurance advice. This podcast is proudly brought to you by 360 Health, MetLife's award-winning end-to-end health program designed to help your clients defend against serious health conditions so they can live healthier for longer. MetLife's 360 Health provides quick, easy and discreet access to over 50,000 leading local and global specialists, including general practitioners, doctors, psychologists, specialists and mental health clinicians. Talk to a MetLife sales manager today to find out more about how you and your clients can access expert medical support and guidance from the comfort of your own home. MetLife. Life inspired by you. Welcome to episode three in our series on how to help your clients manage rising insurance costs. In today's episode, we're going to focus on strategies that you can use to address clients' affordability concerns. I'm joined by Adam French, Director at Squire Financial, and Dr. Jeffrey Scott, Head of Advice Strategy at MetLife. It's great having both of you on the podcast so we can get some insights from what it's like on the ground as an advisor and also get that industry and manufacturer perspective. So welcome to both of you. Thanks for having me. Adam We all know that insurance premiums are increasing and income protection is the star of the show, but I'm really keen to hear from you as to how much of an impact rising insurance costs are having on your clients and by extension on your business. Yeah, it's a good question. It's certainly, I've noticed definitely um, probably in the last six months and even even more so in the last three months, the amount of inquiries sort of outside the normal uh, review sort of catch up process where I'm getting phone calls or emails from clients asking to catch up. Uh, In some instances, I'm getting clients straight away just asking to to cancel. And a very large portion, I'd say at least 90% of those inquiries are are in relation to the rising cost of the the premiums. So yeah, it's having a huge impact and I guess it impacts on my time. It impacts on my ability to go out and and actually find new clients and new business because all my time has been spent or a large majority of my time has been spent managing those those client inquiries in relation to the the rising insurance costs. So yeah, it, it is having a big impact, no doubt. Yeah, absolutely. And Jeff, what about from a manufacturer's perspective? Are we seeing a lot of inquiries direct with the manufacturers or is it mainly through the advice channel or? From what I see is, is primarily across the advice channel. Uh, and what the advice channel is we've been seeing is I, again, when I go around the country and talk to advisors, um, whether it be over in WA, up in Queensland, down in Victoria, New South Wales, or um, SA, um, it's all the same thing. It, and it's not just life insurance. It's basically inflation with everything. So when they're looking at their, ga- their, their gas, their petrol, their electricity, their groceries, their mortgages, um, there's basically inflation with all of this stuff is reducing the purchasing power that they have, which means there's less dollars to go around, which means that when they see even a normal increase in their insurance premiums, which might be due due to an age-related increase on a step premium, they're basically feeling that even more so now because everything else is also um, impinging on them. Right. Okay. Interesting. So I guess coming back to Adam's point, if you're spending a lot of your time doing client meetings with, I guess, one of the sole purposes being how can we reduce these insurance costs, Let's talk about some of those strategies. What are you talking to clients about? What sort of is is it a consistent? Does, does the conversation follow the same pattern, or are people coming at it from different angles, or how are you abro- approaching these conversations? I'd say they're they're relatively consistent. There's obviously some some outliers, but yeah, the the pressing issue is 
um, not just insurance costs rising, but other costs rising, and that's impacting their ability to to continue to afford their insurance. And unfortunately, I think insurance is probably one of the first things <laughs> that people look at uh, when things do get a, get a bit tight, and they're trying to find ways to reduce, I guess, the stress, the financial stress on themselves. So, um, in terms of what their conversation looks like, it's I guess it really does depend on what your existing relationship is like with the with the client who's come in with the the inquiry. If you have a good relationship where there's been consistent contact over a period of time, it can be relatively quick and smooth and easy that that whole process. If the trust is there, the client will sit down with you or have a Zoom meeting and you'll go through and it can be a relatively straightforward process in terms of, you know, just reviewing you know, what are your debt levels now? How many dependents have you got? What's your cash flow? All those sort of very, you know, uh, risk insurance 101 type questions that you ask to find out where you can make some tweaks. Uh, and I think it's important to acknowledge up front and to let the client know up front, you know, if you don't need this insurance anymore, I'm not going to hesitate to cancel it or reduce, reduce it to the level that, that you actually need it at. We're all in the same boat. I've I've reviewed my own personal insurance and in within the last six months for the same reasons, and I'm I'm not afraid to share that with my clients that I've been through the the process myself. So, I think that helps to build that trust. But it's obviously a, a much harder conversation if you don't have that uh, good, strong, existing relationship. Absolutely, I think the relationship has been something that's been a theme through this podcast series. That trust factor, understanding your clients, and having that relationship with them is is what this business is really all about. So what are some of the levers that, I mean, you know, apart from a client just straight out cancelling, Adam, what are some of the levers that you're recommending straight up uh, with some of your clients? Yeah, look, I, I think probably uh, the most common one in the last six months has been um, income protection waiting period going from 30 days to 60 days or 90 days. Uh, that would certainly be the most the most common one that uh, the clients have, have taken. And then on the lump sum cover sort of sides, it's just uh, uh, reassessing their current situation, as I said, debt levels, dependents, et cetera, and seeing if we can, if there's justification for, for trimming the actual benefit levels uh, on those lump sum covers based on their current financial position, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. Now, two main ones. Yeah. Now, for our listeners who don't have the benefit of being in the driver's seat right now, I asked that question. I could see Dr. Scott's face absolutely light up. So I'm sure he's got some, he's got something to say. So Jeff, what are some levers that advisors can look at to help manage these insurance costs? Thanks, Asha. I think that the first thing that I realized that most clients are, are often ignorant of what the options are. And because they think that there's basically two options, either I have to pay the premium or I have to cancel the policy. And those are the only two options that they have. And I think the awareness of the alternatives is essential. And, ha- and again, Adam correctly pointed this out. The relationship with their advisor is key because they'll often ring up the advisor and say, I can't afford this premium anymore. And they think I, the only other option is I have to cancel it. There's a bunch of other things that we've taken a look at. And again, Adam's mentioned the t- two the two biggest ones that I've seen is one is from an income protection point of view, can we actually increase the waiting period, which is great. The other one is, can we reduce this, potentially reduce the sum insured, which is another option. The other thing I, was, I saw is instead of the money coming out of their pocket, if we move the policy inside super, so I'm being paid from assets inside the super fund. But again, there's, there's with all these options, uh, they have to be aware of the risk rewards and trade-offs. So again, moving inside super. Um, another one is decline CPI. Um, CPI for the past 12 months, um, when I looked at the quarterly rates for the past, for the past uh, five quarters, 5.4%, 6%, 7%, 7.3%, and 7.8%. So your client, in addition to their age-related increases with CPI, they're going to have a CPI increase of at least 5%, possibly over 7%, depending upon the situation. So the question is, do you just decline the CPI increase, which again, has a flow-on effect. Um, the other one is that uh, if they have what I call the plus, the extras, the platinum packages, do we actually take off those ancillary benefits and still have a good core benefit, good core policy that has the original sum insured on it? So in other words, we basically say your need's still the same. So we'll keep the same sum insured, but what we'll do is we'll reduce all those ancillary benefits to hopefully reduce some of the premium. Um, 
the other thing is, that, and we talked about this before, Sasha, is do we have a linked cover? So part of the insurance inside super, part of the insurance outside super, so that, again, you know, there's less coming out of the client's pocket or their bank account. But again, the trade-off is that the potential erosion of retirement benefits by putting it through super. Um, then from a lump sum point of view, again, this is one that I, I, I basically say proceed with caution, but again, going from an own occupation definition of TPD to an any occupation definition of a TPD. And depending upon the person's age, I've seen the differences between the two, between 10% and 50% difference in premium. So that's an op opportunity there. Um, with income protection, again, this is one that I've looked at for my own situation. I turned 55 recently. So I'm looking at this from my own perspective is I have a two age 65 benefit period. Do I need it? And so do I reduce it from a 65 to a five year? Now, in my case, is that appropriate? Well, in five years time, if, I, if I'm on a five year claim, that puts me into my 60s, I can then potentially retire, draw down to my super. And in my case, that might works well. For a, for a client who's 31 years old, has a stay at home spouse and three kids under the age of 10, in a, more, in a typical Sydney or Melbourne mortgage, is that appropriate? Probably not. Um, but it, so that's one of the things. Um, the other thing is change your premium structure. If you're on, if you do you stay on level, do you stay on stepped? Um, and depending upon the client, is, is it appropriate? So if I was on a level premium structure and I just took it out, um, step premiums are usually initially are about a third the price and you have the exact same cover, exact same benefits and features, but up front they're a third of the price. Again, longer term, it's going to be more expensive, but for now, from an affordability perspective, that's one as well. Certain companies have what's called a healthy life discount. So if your BMI is under either under 30 or under 25, you then get either a five or 10% discount on the premiums across the board. That's a good one as well. One of the big ones, if your client used to be a smoker, it's now a non-smoker, that almost in almost every case cuts your premiums in half. And it's and again, if it hasn't been forced upon the client by their doctor and they made a conscious decision to do it themselves, great way to get rid of the get basically reduce the premiums by half. So there's various options that are sitting here. There's no one silver bullet because each and every client is unique and each and every client is going to have their own circumstances. And so, again, Adam mentioned this before, the relationship with the advisor is key and basically making sure that the client has an awareness that they have options uh, other than pay the current premium or cancel the policy. And that deep relationship they have with the, with the advisor is essential. Well, I hope everyone was taking notes just then because between Adam and Jeff, that's your masterclass in insurance. <laughs> but I, I want to highlight a couple of things there. First of all, at the very end, when Jeff said, there's no silver bullet, right? We've got lots of levers potentially across lump sum and income protection products, but, and, and not to sound, you know, a, a little bit of a downer here, but eventually those levers are going to probably run out, right? So again, that's where that convers that, that client conversation, that client relationship comes, is is so important. And along with, along with these awareness alternatives, helping make your clients aware, but one thing I wanted to just touch on is with these trade-off conversations, right? Because obviously, if we pull a lever, there's going to be a trade-off, as you've both highlighted. Adam and Jeff, how how can we as advisors, I guess, protect ourselves and make sure we're hitting those standards so that clients understand what it is that they are trading off in these cases? Adam, do you have a process in place for making sure clients you know, understand and sign off and really really understand what it is that they are doing by changing their policies around? Yeah, absolutely. I, I like to, um, I definitely like to use examples and or, or tell stories uh, in relation and that clients can relate to, I guess. So a good one, for example, is with uh, in my own situation, uh, if a client's looking to try and save some money and we talk about removing, say, the extra benefit options off a trauma policy or an income protection policy, I can give an example in, in my own situation where, you know, 10 plus years ago, I had a, an early stage melanoma removed from the back of my calf. Now, fortunately, it hadn't spread anywhere. It was just day surgery uh, and everything was fine, but I was able to make a, a partial trauma claim for an early stage melanoma of my personal um, trauma policy. So, that's an example of where an extra benefit option can be really helpful and great, but it's also an example of if, if you were to get rid of that option, that's the type of thing that you're going to miss out on by excluding excluding that option. 
Yeah, so just telling stories that people can relate to about the different products and options. I have a lot of farmers as clients, so uh, I like when we're talking about accident um, extending waiting periods. Um, a story I might tell a farmer is if you're going from a 30 day waiting period to a 90 day waiting period, and you come off the cut your bike or you break an arm or whatever, on a 30 day waiting period, you'd probably be a pretty good chance to be able to make a make a claim on a 30 day waiting period. But if you go out to a 90 day waiting period with that type of accident for a broken arm or a fractured leg or something like that, it's pretty likely that you're going to be back on your feet and back at work within that 90 days. So you're not going to be able to make a claim if you go for that type of injury if you go to that um, that longer waiting period. So yeah, it's just about picking the client, picking the right example that you can give them that they can relate to to help them make the make the right decision for themselves. Yeah, absolutely. And this is where you know for newer advice, professional year advisors, people who don't have a lot of experience in insurance. You don't have to have your own stories. You can borrow other people's stories. It's just telling the right story for the right client, just like you've said, Adam. So, Jeff, I guess just sort of coming back to that point, is there anything that you're seeing the market or other advisors do in terms of just making sure that that standard uh, standard six is, is hit so that, you know, because – Sometimes clients just sign things without possibly considering all the options. So, what what are you what are you seeing advisors do there? There, there's basically three standards that uh, out of the twelve on the financial uh, financial planner advisor code of ethics. There's basically three standards that keep on popping up when I'm looking at this. One standard five, one is standard six, and one is standard nine. Standard five basically says any time that you give a client a different recommendation, what are the risk rewards and trade offs, and does the client understand? what those trade-offs are and are they happy with them? So that's the first one. And where I've seen that is that if I've had an old legacy insurance policy, and let's say it's a legacy income protection and premiums have, again, we've seen premiums with the legacy income protection policies increase substantially over the past five years. Client says, I can't afford that anymore. I'm now going to a, I need a more um, affordable option. You bring the client across to the newer policies that have been issued from the 1st of October, 2021. And you then spag and say to the client, okay, we have a more affordable premium, but do you know that you're now giving up these various options? And that's in making sure the client's well aware of what are the things you're giving up. So things like the three-tier definition, things such as the um, the agreed value proposition. So things of uh, having an own occupation definition for the duration of the policy to age 65, because most of them change from an own to an any after a couple of years on claim. So it's making sure the client says, okay, do you know what this is? Do you understand the impact? Um, standard six basically says, what's the long-term impact on your client? And so when I look at this, I say, okay, if I'm on a long-term claim and I had the old income protection policies that had an own occupation for the duration, we now go to an any occupation after two years on claim. So what does that mean for my client? It means that the way you're going to be assessed with regards to your occupation may change. So at that two year, after two years on claim, and then we look at standard, we then look at standard nine, which I discussed before is that, is this recommendation appropriate for this particular client? So like I talked about before, me going from an age 65 benefit period, potentially to a five-year benefit period, perfectly okay for me, but for a person who's 31 years old and has a family and has a huge mortgage, is that appropriate for them? Probably not. So it's, it's making sure that each, when you're, which whenever you're sitting down with your client, each of those three are addressed. Do they understand the risk rewards and trade-offs? Do they understand the long-term impact? And is this particular strategy appropriate for that particular client? And Adam mentioned before about potentially reducing the income protection waiting period. If I'm a client who has large amounts of long service leave or large amounts of annual leave or large amounts of sick leave, then that might be a really good strategy based on that particular client's circumstances. Now, if I've just started a new job where I've got no annual leave, I've got no sick leave, I've got no long service leave, then that may not be an appropriate strategy for that client. So again, it's making sure that whatever strategy you choose is appropriate for that client in their particular circumstances. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think it's really important that we keep reminding ourselves of those standards. Um, That's what's going to help our clients and ultimately help us as advice as well. I want to come back to this word that came up before about you know making clients aware of aware of their alternatives 
And and I guess just take a little bit of a side angle on this podcast, which is, you know, we're all talking about clients' affordability concerns. But what about the affordability and cost to serve for us as advisors, right? So how can we manage that for ourselves? Because like Adam said very early on in this podcast, you know, he's spending a lot of his time speaking to clients about affordability concerns. So that then takes a toll on his ability to go and get more clients. So let's talk a little bit about process first. So Adam, what processes do you have? Are you considering putting in place to streamline your business, get the scalability out there so you can address your own potential affordability concerns as an advisor? Yeah, one thing which I did about uh, six months ago was start using software called iFactFind, which I've found a tremendous help in terms of sort of um, smoothing the process, but also helping me prepare for the meeting or conversation that I'm that I'm going to have with the client. So in a, in a typical scenario where a client rings in and they're wanting to review their insurance, they're worried about costs, I will book in the client for a meeting, but let them know that I'm about to send them a link uh, with a pre-meeting questionnaire that will only take them five or 10 minutes to complete. And it just asks very basic uh, questions, but it gives me a up to date, a very up to date picture of their current financial circumstances and what exactly they're needing advice or or help with. So I find that 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 then flows onto a full sort of fact find process, I guess after the the initial f- first meeting if that's needed. But I find that process uh, great for me in terms of preparing for that first meeting and, and and having some questions ready to go for the client based on current information. And I think it also puts the client in a good frame of mind too because, yes, they may be uh, looking at reducing their insurance, but simply by completing that pre-meeting questionnaire, they're able to see, oh, hang on, I still do owe $600,000 on my home mortgage. I've got three kids under the age of 15. Um, so it just refreshes in their mind potentially that, yeah, maybe maybe I still do actually need some insurance before they've even even um to that first meeting, so that's one thing. One thing I've implemented in my in my process in the last six months, which has has helped smooth um, that sort of initial contact um, and first meeting process. Because if you go into that first meeting without cold, without that sort of up to date background information, then there can be emails and phone calls going back and forth, requesting information. You know, getting up to date. Asset liability information, up to date income information, et cetera. Just, just make the whole process really crun- uh, clunky, time consuming, um, and and not pleasant really from a from a client perspective either. So, yeah, that's one thing I've implemented, which is which has been working well. Yeah, and I think that a lot of people are now quote unquote trained in expecting those sorts of online questionnaires. Obviously, it's a very general statement. There's always yeah. outliers, but I think that's using te- utilizing technology as much as we can to get scale in the business is key. So what about for your review process? How do you let clients know that their insurance is coming up for a review? How do you book in that meeting? What's your process look like for that? Uh, so it's different depending upon where the client sits, I guess, in terms of the way that I classify them. But at the very least, though, we'll always get a, a an automated sort of text message or, or email from myself a month out from policy anniversary. And then if I guess in the, they're in my either of my top two categories, they'll also get a, a phone call from me, a follow-up phone call sort of a week after those messages have gone out if I haven't added anything. So yeah, that's basically how I manage it. I have been thinking about having a closer look at that process uh, and incorporating maybe a little bit more data, I guess, in relation to the the age of the client as well, and also and also keeping a track of when when the actual last time I had a decent conversation with the client was as well. So I've found in the last six months where I haven't had a chance to get in front of a client and a client has just cancelled the policy without without a fail, I haven't had any contact with uh, decent contact with that client in the last say three or four years the clients where i have had decent contact uh in the last year or two i've always got in front of them and been able to uh where they still need the policy maintain the policy perhaps reduce some some benefits or do some of the things we talked about earlier in the in the podcast to make things more affordable but yeah i think that's 
I think that's absolutely key is if if you can't if you haven't had that contact, you are really fighting an uphill battle if a client's looking to cancel their insurance. Yeah, absolutely. I don't necessarily think the contact even needs to be, you know, a regular phone call. It can be um, a, a more personalized uh, email. It can be a newsletter. It can be, you know, Adam's thoughts, you know, something like that. It doesn't necessarily yeah. have to be that phone call. So, you know, I'm I'm quite I'm quite passionate about having that as much as possible, regular, consistent, tailored contact um, across a, a, a range of areas. But I guess just coming back to Jeff from a manufacturer perspective, what are you seeing advisors doing? Where do you see processes fall down? Where do you see processes, you know, excel? What what, what are you seeing? Uh, and again, uh, uh, reinforce the Adam's point. Regular, consistent contact with the client is probably the most important way to actually maintain the client, keep the client in the books and all the rest of it. Um, one of the things I've also seen a couple of advisors do is if a client says, I'm going to cancel my policy and they, and they basically said, I've seen a couple of advisors say, before you do that, can you please go see your doctor, have a full medical, have full blood tests to make sure nothing health wise has changed. And then if you're still healthy and fit and there's no issues with you whatsoever, then not a problem. Let's talk about the cancellation. But if you have anything wrong with you, then let's come back and see, one, can we make a potential claim on this policy, depending on which policy that you have? And then two, what's going to be the long-term risk for you based on this, based on your current medical situation? And I think what that then does, it it puts a laser focus on this client to say, wait a minute, I'm not as healthy as I used to be, and most of us aren't. Um, as we get older, things either start to wear off, don't work anymore, or, or fall apart. Um, so... It's making sure that that client is aware that as you get older, there's increased risk. As you get older, the chances of you claiming increases as well. And the question then becomes that what would be the impact on both yourself, Mr. Client, and your family? And if they basically say, doesn't matter, I've got, I've just won Powerball, everything's fine, we're, we're all happy, not an issue. But if they still have liabilities, if they still have a need for that income, if they still have other situations, then that reinforces the need why that insurance is so important. And we know for a fact that from a client perspective, clients usually make decisions in one of three ways. They make decisions based on a somatic decision-making process. In other words, do they trust their advisor? Yes, they do. That trust is strong. I'm going to believe what the advisor says. The other one is analytical decision-making process. I've seen the situation. Um, I, I don't believe I can afford this anymore. Since I can't afford it, I'm going to cancel the policy. That's an analytical situation. The third one is emotional. So what's the emotional reason for me to make this decision? Is I want to protect my family. I want to protect myself. And there's an emotional attachment there. So those are one of the three ways people make those decisions. And normally, when, it can't, when a person cancels a policy, it's because of one of those three things has gone away. Has gone away. Either they lost contact with the advisor, so that somatic decision making process is not there. Um, they, from an analytical point of view, they believe they can't afford that anymore. Or from an emotional point of view, um, the people that they were trying to protect, so their kids have now grown up. They believe that they don't need to protect the kids anymore. So there's often those are the three decision making processes most clients have. It's basically getting back and say, okay, how do we address those situations? And sometimes it's with facts and figures. Sometimes it's with the contact with the advisor. Sometimes it's about saying, okay, let's refocus as to why this is still important. Yeah, absolutely. I bet, yeah, it's it's fascinating hearing those things. And I think that, you know, as advisors, one of the things that we can do for our own personal or professional development is I'm not saying we need to go and study psychology, right? But definitely having an understanding of those basic principles is is absolutely key to help us do our jobs most effectively. You know, we hear about them all the time from the investment side of things, especially, you know, uh, the suck cost fallacy, all those sorts of things, but how it applies then to insurance. Look, th there's just a little bit of time left in the podcast. There's really just one question I, I want to, to, to visit, which is we're talking about cost concerns, the increasing costs on especially legacy income protection. Adam, what are you doing and do you have many clients who you are moving from legacy income protection to new income protection products? There's a lot of thoughts about that out in the, in the market. What are your thoughts on it? Are you doing it much? Are you are you just trying to help clients with their existing legacy and get them to hold on to that as long as they can? What, what are you doing? <laughs> a bit of both. That's a good question. Um, I think initially when uh, the, the newer income protection style policies came out, 
what, a couple of years ago now, uh, I was very much of the view, I think when, when those changes first came, that, you know, for 99% of the of my clients, the right thing to do was to do everything you can to hold on to hold on to those older legacy style uh, products because of the better level of protection that essentially they have as a result of having those products. But I must admit, in the last few months, and I'm working on one case at the moment now where I'm putting together the strategy and whatnot, and I am actually looking at um, changing from the legacy product to a new income protection style uh, product. Uh, and it's just simply off off the back of the the huge premium saving, which the client really values and has made clear that they value that as their number one priority. And again, going back to the earlier conversations we've had, it's just about being crystal clear with them what they are giving up as a result of making that change. But yeah, I guess the fear is from an advisor's perspective is we've seen huge increases already from those legacy style income protection products but the fear is is that they got we're going to continue to see more increases going forward on those style products so it may become more common more and more common if those increases can come in on those older style products absolutely and you know it's it's like we were saying and what, what jet highlighted before about meeting those three standards as long as we meet those three standards and the client is happy then you know the, the yeah. job is done the, the job is done, and if it's in the best interest of the client, it's it's the the job is done. So I think there's there's there is even though the products are now a couple of years old, they've been out to market for a while. I definitely think there's still um, a bit of fear from advisors about making that change. Jeff, what are you seeing? I mean, in terms of of, of premiums or or, or um, new policies coming through, you know, in this case, MetLife, uh, uh, is is there a large uptake in the new income protection products? Is it as is it as as, as big as it was before, or did it take a slow start? What's 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 the view there? What I'm seeing from out and I think Adam's experience is consistent with what I've seen across the country is that most clients love their legacy policy. They don't want to give it up, but there's a particular price point that if the client will sit back and say, if the premium gets above X number of dollars, I can't afford this anymore. And once it gets to that to that point, they go, okay, I need to find an alternative. And they go to their advisor and say, okay, this is my price point. I need to find an alternative. Can you find me a, a more cost-effective pro- policy? And the question that I keep on getting asked by most advisors is, what do you think is going to happen to these legacy policies? Will they continue to increase in premium? And basically, I, I look back to say, okay, have we seen anything like this in the past? And in the past, there's this thing called a lifetime benefit option on income protection policies. And again, great, great benefit. A lot of people loved it. And what ended up happening is that once there was no new people, no new um, life insurance coming into that pool, effectively, you had a fixed pool or an ever decreasing pool of ever aging risks. And when that occurred, those premiums continued to increase as time went on because you basically had to make up for it. When I look at the situation with the legacy policies, again, there's no new people coming into that pool. We now either have a fixed pool or a decreasing pool of the ever aging risks. So do I think that the potential for those legacy policies to continue to have increased premiums will continue into the future? And the answer is quite simply yes. Now, do I know what that what the what the magnitude of that increase is going to be? No idea. So the question that becomes is when do you move your clients? There'll be some clients that will say, I don't care what the price is, I value this so much that I will continue to pay the premium. There'll be other clients that will say, once it gets above a particular price point, you need to move me. Now, the question becomes is from a timing perspective, when do you do that? Because what ends up happening is that as the client gets older, then the chance of them not being standard rates and not being a standard risk and having a loading or exclusion or worst case scenario, having a decline continues to increase. So the question is, okay, where where's that balancing act? Where's the trade-offs? And we come and we get we come back to standard five again to say, okay, at what point do we say to the client, okay, you're gonna give up these benefits? But we can get you a standard rate contract still and lower premium, but you're giving up these benefits in exchange. And it's a really tough question and a really tough discussion to have with a client. So I'm seeing this across the country because you look at the old legacy policies. What do, what are you giving up? Well, you're giving up agreed value. You're giving up a 75% replacement ratio. You're giving up own occupation for the duration of the policy. And you're giving up a three-tier definition. And those are the things you're giving up. Now, what are you getting in return? more consistent premiums, hopefully for the long term that the client can afford those premiums both now and in the future. And it's like, this is a tough discussion. And if I can get you in now, I can get you standard rates. 
if I wait one or two years, you may be either a loading, an exclusion, or a decline. Tough decision, any way you look at it. Yeah, it's interesting. I, re- I think the discussion's okay from an advisor's point of view. You just need to be open and honest and be really clear about what they're giving up. I mean, where you you just need to be super careful is, is with your advice document and your file notes and uh, overdo it, <laughs> I would say, especially the file notes with that type of conversation. Yeah, because it, it's um, it's going to become more, com- more and more common, I would think. You're definitely right. More information is better than not enough when it comes to file notes. I'm sure we can all attest to that one. So, look, we have run out of time. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Adam, for sharing your thoughts, your processes, what you do in both of your businesses and how you help clients manage costs. Thank you very much for coming on the podcast today. Um, And if anyone has any questions or wants to connect with you on LinkedIn, I'm sure they can do that for both of you. Most certainly can. Yeah, absolutely. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thanks, Asha. Talk to you. Thank you.